I'm Catherine Temple. I'm a professor here in the English department. I've been the um, principal investigator for the last few years on a grant called Connected Academics. If you want to find it at Georgetown, it's reinvent.phd.georgetown.edu. Um, and there's lots, lots of good information on there and also links to lots of other information. Um, what we do today will be posted on there as a video. Um, so um, that will, you know, increase the ability of uh, other graduate students to access it. Um, so for today, we wanted to bring together some people who've been working in these areas for the last few years. Um, and, I'm, and thus, I'm happy to um, welcome um, Paul Yachnin, who is the Tomlinson Professor of Shakespeare Studies at McGill University and director of the Early Modern Conversions Project, um, which is a renaissance-related project, yes. not as humanities um, job project project, but among his publications are books like Stage Rights and the Culture of Playgoing in Early Modern England, editions of Richard II and the Tempest, and six edited books, and the latest book, Making Publics in Shakespeare's Playhouse, is coming out in the fall, I believe. Yep. Yeah. Um, his ideas about the social life of art have been featured on radio and now tweeted. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he, he, a recent area of interest, though, is this higher education policy with publications in Policy Options, University Affairs and Humanities, and projects including the TRACE project, um, which I think was part of what first got us to um, start working together a little bit, which is a collaboration of 24 Canadian universities related to, um, et, to education in the humanities and to jobs and diversity and employment after humanities doctoral degrees. I got that right, right? Um, Paul's been instrumental in reinventing graduate education in the humanities across Canada. And I think I first met you when you invited me to come up there for one of the events you were having. And um, I was so excited to see how they were doing this in Canada. <laughs> Because in Canada, they really have much more a sense of the unity of the entire university system, are able to bring together people from across the whole country to represent all their universities, and it's possible to move change forward a little more, more quickly, I think, than it probably is here. So that, that was um, very illuminating. And one of the reasons I asked him to come was to talk about tracing um, some of these um, student employment um, paths some of the stories of students who have graduated with PhDs in the humanities and then have gone on to other professions. I think that's where we're quite weak in our knowledge base. We talk very broadly about the value of humanities doctoral work, but we don't have a lot of stories about how people pursue paths other than going into academia. Um, so um, we're very glad to have Paul with us today. We also have um, Scott Kruzik, who's the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Long Island University. We were fortunate enough to have him teach here with us at Georgetown for a couple of years before they stole him. Um, and he also works with me in the summer um, working on the Warrior Scholar Project where we bring um, uh, veterans and recent uh, people who are just about to leave the military and want to go into college or even into a graduate degree. And they spend a week here doing very intensive work um, to get ready for that experience, transitioning. Um, prior to being at West Point, he served as a speechwriter in the office of, oh, sorry, I missed a sentence there, 13 years at West Point, where he was the uh, chair of the English department and also founded the um, West Point's Arts and Humanities Center. Um, so lot, lots of experience with humanities over the years. Prior to that, he was a speechwriter in the office of the chief of staff of the Army, a ranger company commander with the 75th Ranger Regiment at Fort Benning, and an intelligence officer within the Airborne Corps at Fort Bragg. He retired from the Army at the rank of Brigadier General in 2015, was awarded a Distinguished Service Medal, and this is the kicker, he holds a PhD in English from University of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and is <laughs> very familiar with both the the AC market, right, the academic market, and the ALTAC market um, across the country. So I'm really glad to have them both here. They're each going to speak for a few minutes. Um, we also have here um, Beth Hanlon. Right, I got it right, right? Yeah, um, Beth Hanlon from the Career Center. Um, she's brought some materials to share with you um, and will remain after the talks um, if anyone wants to talk to her about what the Career Center here can do for our graduate students in the humanities. Okay, so let's welcome our speakers. Thank you. Why don't we 
start with Paul and then move to Scott, and then we will have time for questions at the end. Thank you for being here on a very Montreal-like morning, <laughs> or early afternoon, I should say. Um, I'm going to tell you about the Trace Project, um, and I'm going to tell you uh, about the ways in which the work that we've been doing opens new pathways, makes pathways visible, uh, that lead into sectors of work and action outside the academy. Uh, I also want to uh, tell you a, a story. First, I want to uh, tell you why I chose this title for this talk. It's from Shakespeare's play, uh, The Winter's Tale. Um, Florizel um, is in, in love with Perdita and uh, against his father's wishes. And Camillo, who's going to help them, tells them that they're taking a terrible risk. He characterizes it as a wild dedication to your, of yourselves to unpathed waters, undreamed shores. And I quote this, these lines from Shakespeare's play because I want to insist on the reckless adventurousness of what most of us have chosen to do with our lives. Um, this is not uh, about rethinking the PhD as a form of practical job training. I think we need to embrace how wild we are as people uh, and how we are dedicating ourselves to unpathed waters and undreamed shores. I want to tell you a story. Uh, I am not an outdoorsy person. I like 24-hour room service. But a friend of mine was an outdoors person. He was an, a mountain climber. And he persuaded me to do a hiking trip in Cape Scott Park, which is at the northern tip of Vancouver Island. It is the wettest and one of the wildest places in Canada. And it was quite wonderful once I got over my fear and hatred of the pack I was carrying on my back and the mud through which I was tramping. And we set up camp, and we met the ranger, and we asked him about the tides. He had a tide table. Uh, and he told us when the tides were coming in. So we said, right. And my friend Barry said, let's go hiking. What we're going to do is we're going to hike along the rocky beach around, Cape, uh, around the, the peninsula. And so we did. It was really beautiful. Only the ranger had got the tide times wrong. And the water started to come in. We're between the ocean and a cliff face. And it's beginning to look as if we're not going to be able to get out of this situation. And I was very seriously frightened. I thought I was going to die. And Barry seemed unconcerned. He said, no, we'll just go up there. And I, I said, Barry, that's a cliff. We can't go up there. He said, yeah, watch me. And he climbed the cliff. It was, you know, it was 30 feet, 40 feet high. But as he climbed it, I could see as if a staircase opened in the rock. I could see where his feet went and his hands went. And, and I was so excited because I'm a real physical coward, I managed to follow him up and get clear of the sea and get to the top of the cliff, back onto the safe part of Cape Scott Park. I tell you this story because um, it's a, about how pathways can only become visible by following people who take them. And you already, Catherine, you already referred to the fact that people like me don't know these pathways. So we need to find people like Barry who do know them, and then we have to attend very carefully to what they do. <clears throat> and I'm very proud of the fact that since I started doing this work, I, uh, I led a group of people from the States and from Canada who wrote a white paper on the future of the PhD in the humanities. And one of the things we highlighted in that uh, paper was the political responsibility of the universities, the political responsibility of the humanities. Something, and Scott and I were talking about this just before, uh, it has been for the th more than 1,000 years in which the humanities has been a central feature of university training preparation for public life. Somehow we forgot that 
uh, over the course of, say, the last 150 years with the rise of the research university. But it seems to be very important that we begin to think again about the political dimensions of the PhD, political dimensions of the humanities. And this, of course, if you know this person is drawing on the work of Hannah Arendt. Um, that, and she uses the word appearance as a term of art. Uh, appearance is the, is the place where we appear to, as we are to others. Um, and it's, she also says, she's one of the great sort of thinkers and optimists, uh, oddly enough, of 20th century philosophy, a place in which we achieve freedom. And the only place in which we achieve freedom is in the space of the public. Um, so I think we need to pull what we do back into that space. And what we did in the white paper is we insisted that jobs are important. The institution is important. Not saying it's not. But it's only part of the picture. The picture is larger than that and includes the political world as well as the institution, as well as the economy. And here's just four reasons. There are many others about why we need to include the political as well as the institutional and the economic. Um, but this last one is, to me, very important. And it's something that I've struggled with over the past six years. I want to reform the PhD. I'm part of a large and increasingly large group of people across North America and in Europe and England who are seeking to change the doctorate, but not to make it into job training. And the pushback I get, especially from, from academics about my uh, career stage, is that I am the leading edge of neoliberalism, of co the corporatization of the academy. And you know, I bite my tongue, but I'll say, no, I'm just trying to save your lives and save what we do. But we do not want to focus on job readiness. To do that is to defeat the very purpose uh, that we are seeking to fulfill as scholars. So there's a twofold goal in the work that I've done in the work of the Trace Project. Um, and that is just to teach ourselves how to move. If the academy is an island, we begin to believe and we inculcate, in, especially in the PhD students, and I gather most of you are PhD students, a certain idea that the academy is a sacred island, a sacred space. And if you leave this space, your heart will break. It turns out that's not true. There is life off the island. And there are bridges that go back and forth between the island and the mainland. And the mainland's a really interesting place, full of good work and full of work that needs to be done by people like us. And again, we don't want to change the PhD so it becomes job training. That's not what we do in the humanities. The reason our work is so valuable is because it's not like that, because it goes deep, because it's disinterested, because it's curiosity driven. So we started with the white paper. Um, uh, six years ago now. That led to a national project called Future Humanities that uh, brought, the, and the thing, you, the reason you can do what Catherine described in Canada is because Canada has 26 PhD granting universities, whereas the America, you in America have about 300. Uh, so it's very, very hard to do a national project in the United States, but it's possible to do it in Canada. And that's what we did. We spent a year on each campus developing new ideas about the PhD, in the humanities, and we came together in spring 2015 in Montreal, and we compared notes. One of the things we came away with from that conference was a real dis commitment to finding out where the PhDs were. Um, departments very often do track the PhDs. This goes back a few years in the past. Do track the PhDs who get tenure track jobs. The others simply disappear, and that is unconscionable. And everybody at the conference agreed that it was unconscionable. And as a consequence, the TRACE project began, and the big project at the University of Toronto, another project at the University of British Columbia, and so on. So TRACE stands for, we track uh, PhD grads. We report, and so making public the outcomes, although uh, we, when we, ever we do a publish a report, it's anonymized. Uh, we report on where they are and what they have achieved. We connect them with each other through the website, and we sponsor exchanges of knowledge and know-how. 
uh, among people who are inside and outside the academy in the programs and, and, and having pa gone on from the programs. The three stages of the work in the TRACE project. One is very simple and everybody's doing it now. Uh, we scrape the web, it's all publicly accessed knowledge uh, to gather information about what the PhDs are doing now, what the grads are doing now. And we tracked, in the pilot project, we tracked about 2,800 grads across Canada. Um, and the results are now pretty similar across the board. Uh, there have been a number of large studies in Ontario and in British Columbia and in, uh, in, in, the, in the United States. And it's about like this, about 30 to 35 percent of people who complete the PhD in the humanities do find themselves in tenure track jobs. Um, I think that's impressive. To me, it's very important that those other people are tracked and we find out what they're doing. Uh, just by the way, two things. The project is dedicating to getting rid of the idea of failure. People fail, that's fine. I mean, it's not fine, but people fail. A failure that is determined by a particular institutional culture cannot be tolerated anymore. People who are hardworking, extremely talented, come out with a PhD and don't get a tenure track job, they are not failures. That is such an important thing. It's a big, difficult change to make in the culture, but it's something we have to do. The other part of it is that, and this is a particular concern in the United States, but it is a concern also in Canada, is to drain the labor pool so that universities can no longer depend on contingent teachers who teach courses for between three and $6,000 a pop. Uh, and that is necessary. So the more we get the word out that there's life off the island, the more these extremely talented PhDs will go and do other kinds of work, valuable work, and will not hang around hoping to find some kind of permanent place on the island. Um, the second part of their three stages in the TRACE project, first just we, we get the data. We give the data back to the respective universities. Those universities, not the universities, but grad student researchers that we train and support reach out to their predecessors, the grads from their programs, tell them about the project, and ask them if they will consent to be interviewed. And about 10% would do better this time. About 10% in, in the pilot project agreed to be interviewed. So we got about 300 interviews from uh, grads. And what we do with these interviews, we get more data from them, data about support, about obstacles to completion of various kinds, but we also create narratives based on these interviews. And the narratives go back and forth between the writer editor, who's a graduate student at McGill, and the researcher at the various universities, and the person whose story it is, until they get it where they want it, and then it gets put up on our website. And the stories, provide a much more robust account of why people do PhDs, what they get from those programs, and what they do with them. Uh, we also do community building. This is the third phase. We encourage and we talk to the participating universities about inviting grads back. Now, many universities have been doing this for a long time. We want to do it in a much more systematic way so that the grads, especially the non-academic grads, come in and contribute in some way or other to graduate education. And this is part of how we change the culture. Because if, if somebody who has a PhD but is doing work for the government co-teaches the pro seminar for three weeks, that's going to broaden the horizons for the students in that seminar, even broaden the horizons for the professor who will be co-teaching it for those two weeks. Here's some of the benefits of the TRACE project. We need the information if we're going to do well-informed reform of the programs, broader understanding of the pathways, uh, exchanges. And one of the important things, we've been working really hard, you know this. When you say, uh, it was always an uncle of mine. I had six Jewish uncles, seven Jewish uncles. And they all wanted to know, you're doing a PhD? Why are you doing a PhD? In English? How are you going to support your family? Anyway, I ended up being successful that way and managed to support my family. Of course, what we find in our study is that PhDs do support their families. Um, 
But you'll get that all the time. We want to change how the PhD signifies for my, un my late uncles. They're all gone now, bless their hearts. But for many people, like the person who's sitting beside you on the airplane and asks you what you do. And when you tell them you're doing a PhD in English, the person says, oh, I guess I better watch my grammar. <laughs> we want to change that. And what we're also trying to do is create an infrastructure so that the forgotten PhDs, the PhDs in the tenure track, PhD students, faculty members, administrators, and people outside the university altogether can gather together and share experience and begin to take a larger role in public life. And here's just some of the things that the non-academic PhDs bring to the table when they come back. Uh, and they certainly, uh, so we've been encouraging this kind of networking uh, between non-academic PhDs and students. The um, TRACE website is a really nice website. Uh, it's actually going, getting a full overhaul now. Um, it does have a bilingual environment. Uh, this is French and English, not Spanish and English. Um, it's got a lot of space. And it contains uh, both statistical data, a good deal of it. Um, we've got great uh, quanti quantitative analysts who are PhD students. The, I don't do any of the work, right? I just, I, I'm just the face of the project. All the work is done by PhD students, well, almost all of it. Um, and it's got the stories. Um, and it has a networking capacity so that if you're a student and you just check it out and there's somebody who's doing a really interesting thing, you can reach out to that person. Not guaranteed the person will talk to you, but you can do that. So it's just a way of, a very simple way of beginning to create networks and beginning to create community. It will have a, in June it will have a new address, but you'll be redirected. And here's just a, an example of the kind of stats work that you'll find on the website. Uh, there's a lot of it. Uh, it's not what I'm emphasizing now because it's very familiar to, to almost all of us. I learned a lot, by the way. Uh, I learned how difficult it is to do this kind of statistical work uh, and how often it gets fudged. And the, the, the PhD student in epidemiology who was the quant for us refused to do the fudging. I said, couldn't you just give us a kind of big overall stat that would get us into the national paper? And she said, no. <laughs> Toronto did it. We couldn't do it. So some of the stories here is uh, Marie-Pierre Ipicelle, who left a PhD uh, and left the academy uh, to become uh, vice president de Ecotech in Quebec. And you'll find many, many stories like this. One of the interesting ironies of this work is that when we reached out to the grads and asked them if they'd consent to be interviewed, remember the whole point of this project is to change how we view the PhD and to broaden the horizons, it was the tenure, people in tenure track that were most keen to be interviewed. We really had to lean on the others. Erica Dick is a Canada Research Chair in the History of Medicine. There are no failures. Patricia Campbell is a great person. Um, she teaches, she helps develop uh, programs, and she's a farmer. She's a full, productive, valuable life. Um, just two more. Uh, Arkana Rampour is a very important person with uh, CUPE, which is a, a major uh, union in Canada. Uh, Greg Kelly has become a friend. He has a PhD f in English from Oxford. Uh, he got a postdoc at Stanford. When he realized he had a postdoc from Stanford, he told me his heart sank. He didn't want it. He ended up doing editing for a, a romance novel series. Then he found his way into radio, and now he is executive producer of the most important public intellectual radio program in Canada, Ideas. Uh, we all have some uh, PhD students on the website. Uh, Jade McDougall is a very interesting person. She's Métis, so half First Nations, half, half white. Um, and uh, her story is really interesting. She's really brilliant, and she was she was kind of recruited by the university. She didn't want to do a PhD, but she was so talented 
they just leaned on her so hard she came in and did a PhD. She's doing a PhD on hip hop and First Nations culture. She's also a hip hop artist. Um, and when she did a presentation at the 2015 uh, conference, the first thing she said is, I have a job. It's a five year long job and it pays really well and I'm doing what I love. And all the, all the sort of tenure track academics in the room went, oh, that's what she means. Life is different for young people than it was for us. We look forward to permanent positions, but many young people look forward to a series of different positions, and she's very happy to be doing what she's doing. Um, Joe Medjuk is one of the first people I talked to. Um, he, he goes back away. He did his uh, undergraduate degree at McGill, PhD at uh, Toronto. I don't know if you can see the people in this picture. I'll tell you. Yeah, so he, he actually got a job at U of T. He, he ended up doing a PhD in film. He did the first, one of the first film PhDs at U of T. He taught the first all film course at the university. And his friend of his kept calling and saying, come and help me with a project. And Joe said, no, I'm, I'm too busy. And finally his friend prevailed upon him to take a leave from the university and to come help him with the project. The project turned out to be Ghostbusters as friends Ivan Reitman. And you do see Bill, Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, and Rick Moranis standing around Joe. Joe's lounging in the chair. Um, and when I asked Joe, Joe, you did a PhD in film. Now you're a prominent Hollywood uh, producer. The last film he made was Hitchcock. What's the relationship between all the work you did in the Academy on film and the work you've done in Hollywood? And his first answer was there's no relationship at all. And that's an answer that I've heard many, many times from people who've left the academy. Because the academy is a world apart in our, in our way of thinking, and therefore it can't have any possible lines of connection. And as we talked, the lines of connection became more and more visible to him. And it, his story is wonderful. You can check it out on the website. He was an extremely talented uh, scholar. But from the beginning, when he was an undergraduate, he was also a public intellectual. Uh, creating film series at McGill and then at the University of Toronto, writing uh, for and becoming associate editor of a film magazine called Take One, uh, doing regular spots on CBC radio, on film. That's while he was a PhD student and when he was uh, an academic at the U of T. So his, his work on film always had a strong public dimension. Uh, so he's somebody who can show us a pathway. In his case, of course, it started while he was doing his PhD, actually while he was doing his, his bachelor's degree. <coughs> We're just starting Trace 2.0. Uh, it's widely ambitious. It includes social sciences and also fine arts as well as the humanities. Um, and it sets out, as it says here, to create this infrastructure in the human sciences, is what we're calling it. Um, it's a very difficult task to do this kind of work. Um, for me, there are a number of valuable uh, benefits, two principally. One is the importance of the narrative dimension uh, of the project. Uh, everybody is doing the tracking, and a few people are putting a few narratives into the tracking exercise. Tracking is fully half of what we do, and we spend a lot more time on the, on the narrative part than we do on the data gathering part. The narratives are absolutely crucial to the work we do. And they are, of course, integral to what we do as scholars in the humanities. The other piece that I think and, uh, is very important that I didn't anticipate when I started this was the way in which the work has created a, a community in the universities, mostly of graduate students. So the graduate students, who there are about 50 of them, who did the work on the pilot project now talk to each other about what's going on at their universities. They talk to their fellow graduate students at their own universities about the work. And they're also helping to push people like I used to be to think about change uh, in, their, in the graduate programs. Um, the story I told you at the beginning, it didn't exactly happen like that. Uh, it's not that I lied. I kind of lied. Um, we did have to climb a cliff-like structure, rock 
face. But it wasn't because we were facing death from the sea. I just wanted to tune it up. Uh, but I also want to leave you with one thing, and, uh, and that is it's not, about, it's, it's not about rationalizing graduate study. I stick to this idea that what we're doing is foolish. We shouldn't be doing it. If you really wanted you know, that mortgage and the car and everything, there's, go into law, go into dentistry. If you want to do the kinds of things you're doing, embrace the risk taking that you're embracing. I wanted to really emphasize that. Um, and I think that the evidence of the data gathering and the story gathering that we're doing and others are doing shows that it is risky, but it's worth the risk. Uh, there are very, very many terrific outcomes. And the thing is that the world needs us now more than ever. That seems clear. Thank you. And I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to do a little bit of um, uh, introduction. And then I'm going to read, actually, a little bit. And then um, I want to offer some advice and direction, sort of what do I do now? What can I do right now uh, that might be helpful, uh, that maybe I haven't thought of? Um, so. But let me sort of talk about where this comes from. So my own personal background, you heard more than I expected, actually, uh, from Catherine. Uh, I certainly didn't expect all of the, the military stuff, but that's, you know, was, I'm part of my identity, but not the complete identity. Um, I've spent a lot of time in academia, as, as Catherine mentioned. I've, in the capacity of eight years as an associate chair or the chair of a department, an interdisciplinary department, three, well, actually four disciplines, uh, ret comp, English lit, uh, and uh, art history and philosophy. Uh, I oversaw um, between 20 and 25 national searches. And so I understand this, the, this world that we're in and the desperation uh, of uh, folks out there looking for jobs. It's, a, it's extraordinary to see that, you know, up close and personal. Um, I've been involved with running public humanities, public arts and humanities programs uh, at West Point, and that led to uh, the establishment of the Arts and Humanities Center, and now uh, phenomenal drawings. It'll be one of the most extraordinary structures on the Hudson River um, that exists in, in, in the near future. I worked at the National Endowment for the Humanities, and in that role, I oversaw all of the state and territory humanities councils which are in the business of public humanities projects, programs, every day. That's what they do. That's how they survive. And so I, I bring, having overseen that $43 million budget and watched and supervised and assessed programs and visited programs, I've had a lot of interaction with what it looks like on the ground for people who are the practitioners, the folks who found that other path, PhDs in English, for instance who are executive directors of these uh, institutions and, and, and run programs all the time. So I wanna, I'll probably share some of that. Um, contingent fact, I, I am an adjunct, I'm still an adjunct. I won't let go, Catherine. I'm still an adjunct with uh, Georgetown teaching this summer, as a matter of fact, I am, but the Renaissance, not, not uh, our course. Um, and I also taught the 120 students for a semester in Northern Virginia Community College as an adjunct. So I've seen the sort of full spectrum of what that feels like, and I cannot fathom the life of bouncing from one campus to another to piece together enough of those $3,000, you know, courses to sort of manage and to support. But people do it all the time, and I have great empathy. And I will just say the empathy was sort of heightened at MLA. MLA had a couple of connected academics uh, panels. And I went to the one on um, economics or economic dimensions, and there were some extraordinary testimony from uh, the panelists about, you know, what it means to be living without health insurance, what it means to be, you know, um, colleagues with someone who's a sex worker, to make money, to augment the work as an adjunct. I mean, it's really harrowing, in fact. And so as a dean now, I feel a, an a, 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 you know, a very uh, powerful sort of sense of responsibility to try to make change, you know, from within, to educate from within and try to um, league with other deans and other campuses uh, to broaden our sense of what 
uh, doctoral and uh, graduate training in general, graduate education, but doctoral programs in, in particular, uh, can mean and ought to mean and how they should be valued. I think this is a piece we don't talk about a lot in terms of what institutions traditionally value, what they reward, how you get promoted, right? how rankings occur. They have a specific set of metrics that they're looking for. And public humanities engagement or engagement in the community is not generally one of them. Uh, we have to change that mindset. We, we literally have to change um, those who set up the metrics to measure and rank universities so that they include these kinds of vitally important dimensions to uh, an academic program, an academic life, an intellectual life. So uh, that's sort of, you know, sort of what I bring in, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell to, to this thinking process. Now, before I sort of offer some advice and, and, and some thoughts, and I'll actually show you some jobs that are right now, like, you know, on the market, like you can go to a website and there it is, it's been there for two days and <laughs> you can apply. Um, I want to start with a little bit of uh, history, and this is a vignette that I've, I've, I've tr squeezed down a bit, but I think it's really enlightening, and it speaks to this generational problem Paul was alluding to. Um, and I begin with Lionel Trilling, uh, a book called Beyond Culture from 1966, and the final chapter is called The Two Environments. And in this chapter, um, he talks about basically the sort of binary world where we in this room are of one environment and we're the educated, enlightened, sort of culturally in, you know, aware. And then there are those who are outside of it, who are not as enlightened, who don't have the sort of even socioeconomic you know, sort of status, and those who are in charge. Those the messy sort of legislators and the people who have to do the business of life, right? And he concludes, I want to just read through this. <clears throat> So he has this long rhapsody about how valuable it is to be in this second environment that he calls where we fight the materialism. And it's true. I mean, this is important. This goes to the sort of heart of what we do. But it's this position against uh, capitalistic sort of gain and all of that. And he concludes this long rhapsody by saying that to enter the second environment is to join what he calls the party of opposition. And it's a choice that has what he calls its recognized advantages. Thus, as Trilling frames it, this was a moral choice for a life model that would express to the world one's general posture of opposition to it. Despite the crisis that we've in humanities and despite the harsh realities, much of this sort of still rings true, especially for some of our sort of older generation mentors in academia in the humanities. Um, and, and it's part of the general sensibility circulating in humanities departments, particularly in graduate programs throughout this country. But in the midst of the peroration Trilling offers, he says something that struck, strikes me still very deeply problematic. Um, and it, it represents a sort of illogical extension to the notion of, of an oppositional stance. He says, this second environment must have some ethical or spiritual advantage over the first, if only because, even though its influence and its personnel do grow apace, it will never have the actual rule of the world. If its personnel sometimes dream of rule, it yet knows that it would become bored by the dreary routine that rulers must submit to. The blame for the ugly actualities of rule will therefore always rest on Philistine shoulders. So with that final sort of revealing statement, which he says as just, that's a truth, right? That's like, he's not making an argument. That's just the way the world is for trilling, right? That's the way the world is in 1966, where, you know, I've heard you could just throw a dart at a board and you get a, you know, a tenure track job in the humanities somewhere. It was a different world. But in that statement, one finds this sort of purification of that second environment. It's washing of hands, an absolution from any guilt, a freeing of responsibility. Somebody else will do, deal with it, right? It's somebody else's problem, and we can blame them. Thank goodness for those Philistines' shoulders where the burdens will always rest, including the burden of the opposition's critique from its unassailable ethical high ground. 
his formulation establishes an, an inexorable binary. And even if someone in his pure environment, this oppositional environment, thinks that he or she can make a difference, one wants to make a difference, it would be of no use. You will try but grow weary of the routine and you'll suffer blame in the bargain. So, <laughs> you know, when I reflect on that, it's clear that that has been a kind of current of thinking and of sort of positioning. Um, I mean, I grew up with that a little bit, uh, having been sort of um, coaxed into this world. My father, a master's in English, um, taught me and, and made it clear that this was the sort of way to go in the liberal arts, right? This was how you are better, in a sense. But we've been disastrously misled by this mindset, this model of what it means to be an intellectual, let's say. It's a mindset in part responsible for the rise of Trump. The fact is that Trilling had it exactly wrong from both philosophical and a political, or a practical standpoint, political too. I say that Trilling is wrong for three reasons. One, the rule of the world needs the humanities must indeed constantly be informed by the habits of minds inculcated by the humanities. Number two, the shoulders of those steeped in the humanities will bear the weight of responsibility equally well, really better, I think, than the shoulders of the so-called Philistines. And three, here's the real problem. This model forever places the party of the humanities, let me just use that as sort of all-encompassing term, not only in opposition, but in hopeless subordination to and dependency on the will of an establishment. And what adherence to this worldview many of our faculty mentors today fail to recognize or do not fully understand or simply don't acknowledge is that to effect change, one must work from the inside, slowly, incrementally, patiently, but you've got to be in the mix. Solitary rhetorical flourishes won't work. It takes commitment, determination, and the physical presence of dissent within a hierarchy to make a difference. I speak from experience, too, here. Um, I'm, I, I have many little anecdotes about dissenting within an institution. It's not easy. You've got to be careful about that. Uh, look at McMaster. Um, I mean, anyway. <clears throat> but to change minds and to influence policy at any level in any setting, You've got to do it from within. It's an information campaign. What Trilling and his generation perpetuated was a romantic myth, and we must explode that myth of exclusion and insularity and generate a new era of engagement and influence, the bridge between the island and the mainland. We've got to build that engagement and influence. As a profession, we have to confront that myth as another old lie, as pernicious and seductive as Wilfred Owen's old lie, and just as in need of vigilant correction. So that's how I narrate the sort of place we ended up, right? That's how I, I look at it. I look at it through that lens. And we're not to blame ourselves. I mean, we all were down that sort of road, uh, you know, for, for decades. So what am I saying in response to this? What I'm offering is a provisional claim, and it's this, that the study of the humanities, and by that I mean the sustained engagement over time with primary and secondary texts, will help to foster good leadership potential. The potential to do precisely the kind of work that Paul's pointing to in those examples on the Trace website. I use leadership in a very broad sense there. I know we've all become attuned to this tendency in discussions like this to fall into this uh, kind of exceptionalism trap where we really believe that the humanities has something above the STEM disciplines, right? And we've got to be careful about that, especially as a dean of arts and sciences. I have to tell you that there are some really phenomenal folks in, in the sciences uh, who are just as sort of culturally aware and, and, and mindful uh, and, and activist uh, in their sort of stance. Um, but in my experience, broadly, all of it, I have seen that leaders who are steeped in the humanities, especially what might be called the interpretive humanities, I borrow that term from Peter Brooks, they tend to be better leaders overall. Certain traits immediately come to mind. Superior communication skills, empathy, reasoning ability combined with a refined intuition. 
the ability to listen well and reflect, creativity and a willingness to innovate, a respect for an understanding of history, a healthy skepticism, an understanding of peoples and cultures, a willingness to be challenged and to entertain unconventional thinking, and finally, a willingness to confront moral dilemmas and voice concerns when others might cower in hesitation. A qualification. Not everyone is going to develop into a leader by studying the humanities. I know that. <clears throat> some students, some people <clears throat> not really interested, don't want to be sort of active or in charge, and there's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> and some people may not be especially well suited, can be, maybe become better suited through the study of the humanities, but that's okay. <clears throat> but the point is, there are students, there are a lot of students, undergraduate and graduate alike, ask yourselves this question as I sort of go through this, who are both capable of, an, capable of leading and disposed to lead in some way. That is, let's say, to be active, to be an activist. Some are interested in what might be called the social humanities and connecting their academic interests to the broader world, to issues within our society, to public programs that enrich the lives within our communities from children in K-12 education to convicts in the penitentiaries. Students today are far more, it's funny, I wrote this actual line two years ago, students are far more civically engaged than I was when I was an undergrad. And we look at the students, thank God for them, marching today, right? It's true. And many of them retain that impulse to affect the world outside of the academy into their graduate programs and beyond. So, curricula, the structures, the infrastructure of humanities grad programs must have ways of nurturing and channeling those impulses for social engagement. Trace does some of that connecting, right, and mentorship. Because we know the reproduction model is unsustainable, actually a kind of other, another old lie in a sense, when you think about really percentages. <clears throat> we need alternate visions and versions of development, these pathways, advancement, placement, and ultimately professional satisfaction. It cannot, alt, alt, alt is the wrong term, right? We've got to get away from this idea that there is um, something, there's a lesser sort of path, right? Um, there are many paths. That's the way we need to begin to look at it. There are several options, and they need to be made visible right away. The pro-seminar idea, the very first engagement. We should be in, our PhD students must have the two to three week engagement with someone on the outside just to say, hey, here's another option you might want to think about right now before you're too far along. Yes, you might finish right down, write the dissertation, but all along you're, you're engaged mentally and maybe actually uh, in, in a practical sense in that other world. And I'll talk, that's where I'm headed with this. Um, there are futures to be pursued in the nonprofit world and various cultural institutions within government. Go to Canada for that. <clears throat> Um, it used to be easy in 20, you know, er, 2015 and you know, early 16 to talk about that, and now I'm not. <clears throat> I'm glad I'm not working in the government anymore because I'm on camera and I can say things like this. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and in all kinds of, even business settings, and here's, it gets a little tricky. We need to be careful. We don't want to be neoliberal, sort of, you know, um, painted with that brush, and, and, and yet, there are opportunities, I still think, to do good work, even in certain settings that we might find less attractive. But there are plenty of very attractive settings, from the artistic world to cultural um, institutions and so forth, museums, and, and on and on. So on the one hand, we have to open new avenues uh, for advancing the humanities impact within society. And I believe, to Paul's point, which is such a good one, it is not job training, in my view. I don't think of this as job training. I think of this as infiltration. I think of it, right? You talk about inreach, right? But I, outreach and inreach. And I think of it as weaving that mindset into places where the influence will be felt, visible, translatable. And by doing that, I think we actually help the, the whole humanities project because people become aware of that impact and the stories behind someone with a PhD who effected this change. 
On the other hand, we also have to begin changing the nature of the discourse that governs the profession. Here's where we can all make a difference. And I kind of, when I say we all, I tend to imagine an audience of, of folks in positions, not like I'm in a PhD program and I'm about to, you know, suffer the, you know, uh, the, 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 the challenges of, of going on the market. I think of people who can influence from the inside. Um, professors and, and, and deans and other uh, administrators. But also you, because you have to push them. You have to demand. You have to demand the right kind of mentorship. It can't just be one kind of mentorship. And if that person doesn't have it, then get the outside voice to come in and ask for that. So I'm talking about curricula, professional mentorship, training for how to pursue the various job markets, engagement in the public humanities. Um, I believe doctoral students should be encouraged, if not required, to develop and produce public humanities content, just as an example. But again, it, it's going to take institutional commitment. We're on a long sort of strategic path here to revising the standards that institutions see uh, as measures of success. We're not going to overhaul the humanities PhD today or this year by 2020, but we're in a process. Uh, this Connected Academics is an example, reinventing the PhD. Um, the Next Generation PhD program out of NEH is another complement to this. So it's, it's actually rising. Canada has been well ahead of us, but it is sort of percolating up in uh, the United States uh, university structures. That's strategic level, five, seven, ten years, whatever. Here we are today, right at sort of its tactical level. Uh, what, meaning what tactics, what steps can I employ right now in the midst of a graduate program, for instance, to better position myself? So I'm going to talk to you just uh, from three perspectives. You know, I, I, I have these various identities, but I've got experience in government, I've got experience in the military, and I have experience in the nonprofit sector. And so um, what I would say is hold on and maybe the government will be a better place to work uh, in the future, but there have been some very good jobs despite the administration, there are often good jobs, and I'll show you an example of that uh, in a moment. Um, the military, I'd like to just emphasize that most of us are aware now, and especially because of the, the, the crisis, people are looking everywhere. But I, we were at a conference a couple years ago, uh, Catherine and I, where someone mentioned that the United States Naval Academy, you know, someone of, of note had said that they didn't think it was an academic job to teach at the United States Naval Academy. Most of us will scrunch our eyebrows together at this. But I fear that there are some people maybe just not aware of the full spectrum of availability. And frankly, the, there are wonderful opportunities, and the students tend to be very, very good at uh, the military academies, whether it's the national level or you're talking the Merchant Marine Academy or Coast Guard, doesn't matter. VMI, the, the, the Citadel, the private ones, too. So it's not all about weapons contractors, right? It's about morally developing and making critical thinkers who are going to be in charge someday. Um, I just, I'll give you an example of this nonprofit. I, I'm going to show you a number of things. But there are many, many cultural nonprofits uh, that are suitable, um, offering jobs that, that are suitable for somebody with a graduate degree in the humanities, even a PhD. Um, a colleague of mine, just I was just a reference for a colleague of mine who, um, God bless her, she's, she's ABD, um, but, but still working on uh, finishing up. And she just became, because she started early getting her foot in the door at one of these uh, cultural nonprofits, Virginia Humanities. Uh, it's called the Virginia Humanities Foundation. You look it up. She started there, getting some experience. She eventually worked at NEH with me. Now she's the vice president of Minnesota Humanities. And when I throw these terms in these organizations out there, you scratch your head, you go, I've never heard of these. How many of you have ever visited or heard of your state humanities council? A couple. I am always pleased to see that a couple are out there. But not many. Not many. She's now the vice president in Minnesota of a phenomenal, with a, with a tremendous budget, of uh, Minnesota Humanities. Um, so some immediate steps. <clears throat> Here's where I'm going to, you have a handout with some guidance. And I'm going to just use a couple things. So first, this is an older sort of um, web shot, screenshot of jobs uh, available on nonprofit professional advisory group, nonprofit uh, professional positions. And a lot of this won't necessarily be um, relevant. You have to sort of look through and keep an eye on it. But there are 
organizations, foundations, charitable uh, organizations and so forth, foundations, that do often have programs. Uh, you know, when you see something like Program Officer Grand Rapids in the Kellogg Foundation, that's something you ought to click on and find out exactly what that is. You'd be surprised, right, at some of the descriptions. You might be interested in racial equity and community engagement. That might be something you would like as part of your identity to sort of enact, right, to take to, to the field, to move out of the classroom a little bit, right? I'm a veteran, okay? I mean, I, this is just part of my identity. So when I did public engagements, uh, public humanities, arts and humanities programs, they tended to be veteran flavored. I put on art shows and dance and poetry readings by veterans and then had dialogue about this. This is basically the public humanities, public arts in, in action. Um, and so you all certainly have whatever it is that sort of makes you tick outside of the classroom per se, outside of your research, outside of the archive. Think about that. Think about how you can bring that uh, perhaps into uh, volunteer work or, or whatever it is to get a foot in the door. So this is a little old, but I do have, I want to show you, so Oh, so, and I still do this, um, just as an example. Two nights ago, uh, I was, so, anybody heard of Theater of War? So, one of the most important, I will say this, okay, I'll, I'll claim this. One of the most important public humanities activities of the last decade in the country, Theater of War. You can look it up. Theater of War has now branched into 22 different projects. They have the Antigone project, they just started the Tecmessa project. Who's Tecmessa? Wife of Ajax. Ajax, Sophocles' play. What the theater of war does, this is public humanities in action, by the way. Here are actors reading from Ajax, the play by Sophocles, acting it up. Tecmessa, she was in Law and Order. You're famous, he was in The War Horse. He's Ajax. They read, we have an audience. This was at uh, WNYC two nights ago, Green Space, New York City. They talk, they're, they're introduced. Here's this play by Sophocles. War is a persistent condition in Greece, 80 years out of 100 uh, in, in the decade in question, or in the, in the century in question. Um, what does it tell us today? How do we respond today? How can we make sense of this? We, how do we layer meaning on this? That's as soon as you do that, we're talking to humanities, right? This is public humanities. So the next step of this is to bring a panel forward of folks who work in the world of veterans' uh, health, uh, suicide prevention. Um, you know, I'm a dean. I am a veteran. I, this is how these two things sort of come together. I talk about my own experiences as a veteran. Uh, this is a spouse, current spouse in the Army. We provide some thoughts, and then the moderator asks questions to the audience about what Sophocles was up to. And we end up with these wonderful sort of discussions for two hours about our present condition. And when the veteran voices and the spouse voices in the audience come up and alive, because they're enabled by the forum, and in some cases for the first time ever speak about experiences, it's moving, it's powerful, it changes. And then those conversations go on into the hallway afterwards. And this is community engagement right at the lowest level of helping to educate, helping to share stories, right? So just, that just happened to happen, so I wanted to share that. All right, here's a job, education specialist. Boy, that does not sound like one I'm gonna run to, right? <laughs> Especially because it says US federal government. In fact, whew, skip right past it. But where is it exactly? In the National Museum of African American History and Culture, in the Department of Education. Yeah, another one, Department of Education. Ugh. But, but save our African American Treasures program. You are going to oversee this, right? That's the job we're talking about. Qualifications. A degree supplemented by major study in a subject that's appropriate to the position, right? In addition to this, you may qualify if you possess the following specialized experience. So you are some expert in African American history or culture, right? Um, look at the bat. last one. If you have a PhD or equivalent, Related to the position, this, this actually kind of trumps everything. They want to hear from you, okay? So you have to sometimes get past and look into uh, titles and things. So let me give you a couple others example. This is indeed on this, on this sheet. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole sheet. I want to leave time for Q&A. But I tell you, go to certain websites. Indeed's great, by the way. 
It's really good. Uh, MLA is not so good anymore. The Jill, although it's still there. Chronicle is better. But honestly, pretty much all the stuff is out there on Indeed these days. Now, here's a screenshot, okay? What I Googled. I, go I looked up um, arch jobs in employment, in the, in, like arch jobs. But guess what comes up? Director of Public Programs, National Foundation of the Arts and Humanities. What does that mean? Well, we have an NEA and we have an NEH. And the National Endowment for the Humanities, 10 days ago, advertised the Director of Public Programs. That's a PhD job, by the way. Now, it's not a starting PhD job, but it's a PhD job. Humanities Administrator. This is actually right out, this could be right out of the uh, program sort of a job. Humanities Administrator in the Division of Preservation and Access uh, for artifacts, material, uh, preservation of material uh, culture, and, and uh, all kinds of projects that they do are terrific. And I happen to click on one that's not shown here called Arts Manager at the British Council. Uh, and I think I have a copy of that. Um, in, in, I have some descriptions, job description. You can shoot a photo of or whatever up here in a minute. Um, by the way, Remember I talked about these military academies, right? So here's what you're going to find sometimes. This is great government stuff. Assistant professor, uh, professor position, you know, number 1806 DFPY. <laughs> Delta Foxtrot Papa Yankee. You're going to skip. You may all, what the hell is that, right? You're not even going to look because that's how it's advertised. Unless you click, you won't learn that it's Department of Philosophy, Assistant Professor in Philosophy. Oh, that's your code for philosophy. Nice. Well, gosh, Colorado Springs, right? So that's just one. I thought that was funny when I saw that. Um, <laughs> Ford Foundation has a learning officer. The full description is right there. These are right, like, literally in the last couple of days. Kellogg, uh, director of Michigan sort of programs, I think it's called. Uh, pretty, it's a pretty big job. Um, but this is, these are all socially sort of engaged to help socioeconomic sort of disparity, um, and, and the kinds of conditions that we all care about. In fact, in some ways, we write about these, right? We bring this sensibility into our academic work, our research, but often it just sort of lives there. And I would suggest if you've got something that's of particular interest to you, to look for and maybe find a fit and, and begin to volunteer, perhaps. Um, William Davidson Foundation, Program Officer, Israel Insights. This is all about somebody with a, a great deal of information or, or knowledge about um, the politics and history of Israel and to be able to collaborate in policy and decision making and support and so on and so forth, a spokesperson uh, for uh, the foundation. I thought this one was interesting, research and evaluation officer, a doctoral degree is strongly preferred. This it took no time. Like I was doing this, where was I? 9, 9.30 on the train last night, right? 9.30 on the train. Just grab it, because I knew. Because I was delayed two and a half hours getting in on the train from Brooklyn. So I got to prepare for this. <laughs> OK, um, I think that's my last slide. And I want to stop and turn it over to Catherine. Thank you so much, Catherine and Lauren and Paul and you all for coming. You know, some of the themes that we heard today really resonate with the work that I've been doing the last few years, the idea of public humanities as outreach, which is a sort of traditional idea, which I try to match by talking about inreach, which is a less traditional idea about ta taking our sort of ways of thinking, our training, it's not really our skills so much as habits of mind, right, outside of the academy and into these other organizations. That's the contribution I think we can make. One thing we talk a lot about when we talk about whatever these things are that are not skills is um, the idea that you know we're used to working in areas of ambiguity with a great deal of information from a great deal of different sources. That doesn't scare us. That doesn't make us feel insecure. That's what we learn how to do in doctoral humanities programs, right? And I think you know that's something that's not well understood, right? That has to be translated when we go out into these other. Um, careers in these other venues. So, um, you know, those, those are the kinds of things we're thinking about. And it, I think if you go to the website, you'll see some of that language and some of that material there. And it'll help you rethink sort of what your education is meant to you and what you're going to be able to do with it. So I won't go on from there, but um, I'll open it up to questions at this point.
No questions. Yes. Yes. Um, so the question is, are we, I hope I get it right. The question is, um, are we proposing a sort of plan B at the end of the degree program, the end of the PhD, or something that someone should be thinking about already? Okay, so I'll just, I'll let them speak as well, but I will say right away, we don't talk about plan B anymore. We talk about a lot of different plan A's, okay? And yes, I do think that we need to start thinking about this even as early as the MA level. Certainly in a lot of um, BA programs, people are already thinking about this, right? So, you know, it's interesting to me that in the sciences, it's quite common to um, require young graduate students to do high impact activities outside of the academy. And that, I think that's the direction that we really need to move in. But I'll let you. Yeah, two, two things. Y yes, no plan. Plan B. Um, one is that the universities are developing, and I think this is a very good innovation, the independent development plan or individual development plan, so that the students working with others start to think about these things from the, from the start. The other thing is very general, very simple. I, I believe we only each get one life. And why should you not pursue the thing that you love best? And that's why I, you know, that's why I sort of emphasize the risk taking. It is risk taking, but there are no pathways that are without risk. But there are some pathways that can make you happier and can fulfill you. Um, just one thing, I, I had a huge dog years ago, 150 pounds, and uh, I was a poor dog owner back then, but I would take him out late, late at night uh, because there were police and various people around, and I, there was a field across the way beside a school, and I would let him go. And he had a white tip on his tail, and he would just start to run. And I could know that because I could see the white flash as he leapt through the grasses. He was doing what he had been intended, what he was meant to do. He was mm -hmm. fulfilling himself, and that's what we need to do also. There's an article actually out there by a historian, I think, called uh, No More Plan B. And it's, it's really a sort of uh, manifesto for the, the this need to stop talking about it. And, I, I, and I'll tell you, I, we have masters in English uh, where I am, and, and my whole thing is I want every one of them to be, uh, I want all of these students, and, and a, an MFA in creative writing, I want them all out here in these uh, cultural nonprofits. There's uh, 213, inter I live in Brooklyn, uh, you know, where I work, but you know, just in that area, there are 213 internships, many of them paid right around in, in these kinds of areas, uh, that is to say the cultural um, uh, areas, and uh, that experience is valuable. I mean, it, and, and so I think from the very start, even before, right, even as, as we're teaching undergrads, we should sort of engage them and, and sort of get them excited about these opportunities. So it becomes a habit of mine, it's just the kind of thing we do, and when we get to PhD programs, it ought to be that you're introduced to and learn from these folks who have done these other, <clears throat> uh, have chosen different pathways, and they share with their stories. Uh, and I'm so, I mean, it's thrilling because I think there is a, a general reluctance, and I think you acknowledge that on the part of those folks uh, to come forward maybe and, and tell their stories, but they're out there. And, and I will tell you one place, I, I mean, I, I didn't go through my recommendations, but I really recommend these things. Meet your state humanities council if you haven't, because you'll meet people like yourselves there, right, with advanced degrees in the humanities. Um, get on their email, go visit an event, you'll get all the updates, and there are multiple reasons for that. Um, there are grant opportunities uh, for established scholars. What I do is I introduce them as potentially public scholars who will work and do a program. I bring the, the, the program to the campus, you know, so that you kind of create a synergy. Um, 
but that's, that's the kind of thing that just should be part of what we do all the time. Yes. Thank you. That both the talks were really interesting. Um, I just wanted to in, invite you guys to say a little bit about um, what, if you've seen any movement toward rethinking the dissertation mm -hmm. in light of um, <laughs> this kind of, uh, you know, idea that we should have more opportunities that aren't just straight academic <laughs> jobs. Um, because at least in my field, which is philosophy, um, the dissertation that you need to write in order to get a tenure track job is very, very different than the one that you would need to write to do more publicly engaged work. Yeah. So I, and as a dis writing my dissertation now and trying to keep myself open to alternative academic paths, I'm sort of struggling with this, right? Like, if I wanted to leave the tenure track option open, I have to produce something that's highly technical, mm. not accessible. Mm. And if I want to, if, if I want my dissertation work to be relevant beyond the academy, yeah. I often have, I just have to produce a different document. Sure. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's true. We have to open up. Uh, there's a there's actually a national project. We can do that kind of thing in Canada, yeah. rethinking the, the dissertation. But when I started, actually, I didn't know, and my colleagues, most of my colleagues in the humanities, didn't know that it's done differently in other departments in my university. Mm. Uh, when they said, "Well, we can't do it as a collection of essays. It can't be done. It's never been done that right. way." Right. Half of the actually, other departments said, "We already other departments do that." Said, yes, we do that. <laughs> so yeah. what we need, of course, is a broadening of of possibility, and you. The one way to do it is, and I'm working with a number of students who want to do this, and I'm, I have to be careful for their sake. Mm. Um, so one student is doing her introduction is Shakespeare and Descartes, not Descartes, but Mont, uh, Montaigne, mm. sitting on her balcony looking at uh, Mount Royal, the mountain in Montreal, talking about what led them to, and engaging her in conversation. And I said, I support this completely. What you need is a lot of footnotes. So. You know, and you and so you need to work with your supervisor, and and he or she's got to work with colleagues and say something interesting. We're trying something interesting. Get them on board. My, uh, that's you know, <laughs> we're not going to be able to help you now. I, I can tell you that you're going to have to write that technical dissertation. There's just not. But what I hope is, you know, uh, you know, there's going to be a, a public uh, public humanities PhD eventually. Here? Yeah, um, we're actually launching a certificate this summer um, for uh, it's a graduate certificate in public public and engaged humanities. All right, the website should be going live any minute. Right, <laughs> right, Lauren. Yeah, um, it's going to take place in the month of June. It's going to be a hybrid course with Saturday meetings and then um, Wednesday evening online meetings. Um, so you know that would be something to consider. So th there are going to be programs like that. And that's the first step towards um, the next step will be a master's in public and engaged humanities that will launch probably a year later, and the next step will be the PhD. Um, but, you know, one thing I want to say about this technical dissertation is that I, I think um, many academics who've gone that path have ended up doing the kinds of things that I'm doing, which I'm, you know, just finished writing a book that is a 18th century law and humanities type of book that's not for, you know, a public audience. But I also do all of these other things as well, right? And I know it seems very difficult to manage that kind of um, diverse publication schedule when you're writing your dissertation, but to keep that in mind and keep thinking about, like, what are some things I could do here that the public might be interested in? And to keep, there's just a lot of online opportunities now to get that kind of stuff out as well. That, that, that I would echo that and yeah. say, you know, there's going to be a, a serious amount of satisfaction when you complete that thing. I mean, honestly, you'll be very proud of that. And that work is, at, we, why did we come to this work in part? Because we're driven and we love it. And I'm very proud, I'm very, I, I respect the whole model that I was sort of brought through. Um, don't want to see it go away and proud to be a product of it. But at the same time, you can go online and you can start doing some of the searching. There's a program out in Washington and Oregon called Think and Drink. You're going to laugh at this, right? They get, they get, they take over a bar and they have standing room only and they tackle moral, complex this sort of ideas and, and issues in society today, moderated by scholars like yourself, right? With a, with a radio DJ and some other people. And it doesn't turn into a brawl, it turns into an actual civil dialogue. And uh, so, so if you kind of watch where there might be an opportunity to sort of 
learn and, and, right. and, and gain some other. And, and you know, even it's, it's, it's interesting that we think we can't do both of these things because having worked with um, a bunch of folks in the sciences who are um, applying for NSF grants, graduate students, they're all doing both these things. Um, so I don't think that we can't do it. I think we're not being um, encouraged to do it, mm -hmm. maybe as much as we should. Yeah, and I, I guess I just follow you and to, I didn't mean to suggest that having footnotes is just a kind of accumulation of useless data mm -hmm. at all. Um, the core of what we do is that kind of uh, uh, conscientious scholarship. Mm -hmm. That's what makes the work that we take to the public worth their time. You know, and that's what makes, here's the thing about this in -reach. that's what makes for patient decision making considered decision-making because you know you've got to do some research. I, I'm, again, glad not to be in the government, but the ridiculous pace at which someone decided that it would be policy to allow s teachers in public schools to carry deadly weapons is insane. It is insane. And, and there's almost no critical thinking at, at all going into that. So we have to think about, you know, uh, the value of the deep dive and its applicability and its translation, right? right. right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, Frederica. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. I'm a chair of a small PhD program here at, at Georgetown, and so we are actually all very, all faculty, very open and supportive of a range of careers. But one uh, challenge we face is the issue of mentorship, and you both addressed that. I mean, it's clear that that's crucial. We as academics can provide only very limited mentorship. We've tried, and we are connecting with alumni, but it seems to me what's really necessary is um, pooling of resources across the university, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. I don't know if you have other suggestions, and I'm sure that the public humanities certificate is going to help in this regard, but. But it's hard to do that as a small program. It is. Mm -hmm. So I, my, my, um, my practical sort of response to that, the way that I'm trying to do this, is a partnering, a literally sort of a more formal partnering with New York Humanities, which is just down in lower Manhattan, we're in Brooklyn, um, where we become, um, this bridge is sort of between us and we can bring in their expertise and their programs, educate, but also funnel folks over to, to gain experience. But you can really, it becomes like an extra layer of mentorship and expertise that you're attached to then. So a woman named Sarah Ogre is the executive director, PhD, and I think it's in history. But I can bring her in to a group of students and that's, wow, just like the folks we saw on the website. Wow, what an interesting person, what an interesting life and different sort of way of uh, engaging. I bring my faculty to the events. We, you know, it's like we're trying to generate a sort of extra dimension uh, to the campus through this sort of community engagement. So I would say, um, I mean, you're almost here in Georgetown. There is a DC Humanities. Uh, they do a version of Think and Drink, by the way. Uh, they don't call it that. They call it something else. Um, and um, Maryland Humanities. Uh, Phoebe Stein is the executive director of Maryland Humanities. That last name, by the way, is a relation of Gertrude Stein. For anybody who may find that interesting. Uh, so Phoebe is phenomenal, and they're in Baltimore, uh, and they have great programs that reach all over Maryland. So some people probably live in Maryland or close by. But uh, I mean, just just becoming familiar and and saying, hey, come talk to my department, come talk to my faculty, tell us what you do, and then sit down and lunch, and you know, start to, to gain some other ideas. But I think that I mean, it's very hard for faculty who are embedded in this world where you're publishing and you're you're doing administration and you're teaching to do that kind of outreach, and it really needs to be institutionalized. Right. I agree. And that's where I think the value of a project like Connected Academics lies in that they provided the funding to move this forward, right? So hopefully we can build on that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I understand your Yeah, there are, I mean, there are all kinds of initiatives yeah. like that. Yeah. U of T hired a career counselor who is a PhD in the humanities. Um, and so that, that's a way of bringing support. University of British Columbia has a wonderful public scholars initiative where people apply, they get fellowships, and they get set up to do the kind of work they do inside the university, outside the university, mm -hmm. and they learn how to do that kind of complex translation. Mm -hmm. So um, we're just about out of time. Is there maybe one last question? 
burning to ask? Okay. Um, I do want to suggest if you go to the um, reInvent PhD website that you also go to the MLA Connected Academics website because they have a huge budget for that website <laughs> and they have lots of great interviews with people who have pursued different <coughs> paths. All right. And I think it's, you know, the more we see that, the easier it is to imagine us doing things like that. Just, but, you know, at this point, on a, with you know, the kind of dissertation that you're writing. I think the, um, the bridge, it seems pretty fragile right now, but there are people out there using those um, degrees to do some very interesting work. So um, I want to thank our speakers again and thank everybody for coming. I've really enjoyed this. Um, hope it's been useful. Thank you. Thank you.